Your Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister Berdybek Saparayev, Your Excellency, First Lady of Burkina Faso, Madam Sika Kabore, Your Excellencies, Ministers and Honorable Guests. Thank you. I would like to thank His Excellency, President Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, as well as the Deputy Minister as well, the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Kazakh Institute of Oncology and Radiology, Kazior, Dr. You know, the head of which is Dr. Deliara Kaidarova, the Kazakhstan Cancer Society and Together Against Cancer, for hosting the UICC World Cancer Leaders Summit in beautiful Nur Sultan. And I think I just want to take a moment to say how amazing and exquisite the entertainment piece that was uh, presented yesterday at the gala. It was such a treat. Thank you so much. We are all here today making the effort and taking the time to keep cancer on top of a very crowded global world agenda. We are all here today because we reject the status quo that 70% of our children, brothers and sisters perish needlessly from cancer diseases that can be cured. For the simple fact that they either live in the wrong place, the wrong time, be in a conflict zone, or have a bank account that is not immunized against catastrophic expenses. We have come a long way since September 2011 when we all put non-communicable diseases, NCDs, front and center on the first UN high-level meeting. Much has been achieved since then on the global advocacy level. We now have all the tools at our fingertips. The WHO best buys, the updated cancer resolution, the essential medicines list, the essential diagnostics list, the list of priority medical devices for cancer management and others. We have it all. Thanks to that sustained effort by the whole NCD community, we have seen sporadic progress on NCDs on the national level worldwide. Certainly, we have seen more countries prepare their operational cancer plans than ever before, from 66% in 2013 to 81% in 2018 more countries establishing cancer registries, and more countries starting to invest seriously in cancer services for the first time. So there is progress. However, the progress is not big or fast enough, enough to make a downward trend in the mortal statistic of 2018, where we still talk about 18.9 million new cancer cases with 9.1 million deaths, 70 of which are in the low and middle income countries. The good news is that we now have a new drive from the UN General Assembly through the political declaration on universal health coverage, UHT, urging countries to implement UHT so that all persons, whoever they are, wherever they are, and whatever their income level, are guaranteed an essential package of quality health services without having to incur catastrophic expenses. UHC is about not leaving anyone behind. To really understand the value of universal health coverage, UHC, is to imagine its absence. To imagine for one second what it looks and feels like. If you or a loved one who is struck with cancer, for example, is not covered for treatment nor protected by UHT. It's like looking at someone and saying, there is a magic potion that will save your life, but unfortunately, I'm so sorry, it's not for you. This is what lack of UHT and access to treatment is all about. We can sugarcoat it all we want, but it is about the harsh and tragic reality of depriving someone from crucial, life-saving treatment. UHC promises a lot. 
At first glance, one would be forgiven if one dismissed it as perhaps yet another idealistic rhetoric. It could sound like an impossible utopian dream. However, I assure you that the UHC ambition is absolutely not a dream. I have just come back from the UN high-level meeting in New York, more hopeful and more energized as ever, as I heard many leaders who have embarked on implementing UHC. Dr. Tedros, Director General of WHO, said in his opening speech, health is a political choice. And he was glad that many leaders have made that responsible choice. From Rwanda, Turkey, Thailand, Oman, Uruguay, Zambia, and others, following in the footsteps of the pioneers of UHC, such as the United Kingdom, Japan, and Germany. UHC was often thought as the luxury for rich countries. However, this could not be further from the truth. As Dr. Jitahi from AMREF Africa Organization coined it superbly, he said, the decision to embark on the UHC journey is not because you are a rich country, but precisely because you are a poor country. Our healthcare systems have long been geared to treat communicable diseases only, and certainly not to prevent disease, making some to call ministries of health as far as ministries of disease. With the rise of the double burden of chronic diseases, many systems are literally bursting at the seams and have become fragmented and efficient, and therefore defaulting on delivering life-saving treatments to their citizens for cancer and other NCDs. Furthermore, some countries simply did not attempt to tackle NCDs and cancer, especially thinking it is too costly and overwhelming to deal with. Of course, we, the NCD community, dispelled that myth by proving that by investing $1.7 per person per year on prevention and early detection, saves countries in treatment costs by $350 billion cumulatively by 2030. $350 billion saved in treatment costs. Not bad. Whilst the focus at the UN high-level meeting was on the benefits of UHC, which are clear for all, there was not enough conversation about the how to implement UHC. From my own humble experience as former Director General of the King Hussein Cancer Foundation, KHCF, and as President of UICC, I have been privileged to meet and learn about the challenges and obstacles of many countries on the ground. In my humble opinion, many good intentions fail purely due to lack of political commitment and to governance and managerial approaches. I would therefore like to highlight a few of the main important prerequisites and contextual drivers that have to underpin the approach prior to embarking on UHC, all equally important. Firstly, without question, you need political will from heads of government and across the whole cabinet. That is why those who have implemented UHC in their own countries made sure that the decision was a whole cabinet responsibility as a long-term goal. This ensured that the cabinet was committed not just to the concept of health for all, but rather all for health. Secondly, the overall thinking has to be one of transformation. UHC is all about efficiency. Therefore, it can only work if countries take a new, fresh look at their health and health financing systems to re-transform, reorganize to meet the epidemiological needs of today, making sure to strengthen their primary health care system as a cornerstone of their efforts. The usual transient band-aid solutions no longer work, my friends, and have become extremely wasteful and inefficient. Thirdly, there has to be a decision 
as to the managerial structure and engine that will drive the process forward in a terrain that is long-term and fraught with many obstacles along the way. The countries that are delivering UHC understand the limitations of their current capacities at their health ministries, which do not typically include a team of long-term strategic planners. Health ministries' roles in many countries end up being more operational rather than being able to focus on the long-term strategic and policy changes needed to improve health nationally. Once a minister is appointed, he or she enters the treadmill cycle of barely managing his or her own schedules. I can see many ministers here nodding as I speak. I can see that. So those who have a long-term vision for UHC have established a transformation team, like the model in Turkey, or policy entrepreneur team, like the model in Thailand, or the planning commission team in India, and so on and so forth. Strong governance mechanisms are crucial as the planning and implementation stage can take from two to five years and above certainly exceeding any political cycle of any minister. The transformation team is the only way to make sure that the cabinet commitment is sustained for the duration of the project and the journey to achieve UHC and beyond to its monitoring and evaluation. Fourthly, but certainly not lastly, the people, the people, UHC is about giving healthcare access to the people they intend to serve. Persons healthy or unwell have to be at the center of it all. In many countries, people have long lost trust in their public health system. Gaining the trust of the people is crucial, and they have to be part and parcel of the UHC plan from the beginning starting from enshrining the, and delineating their health rights in the laws, making sure that all understand it is a right, it is not a gift, it is a right that can be given, it is not a gift that can be given or taken at will. Delineating those rights in, into what to expect from a health system in terms of respect, quality, delivering an essential package of services, procedures, and transparent channels for public complaints will offer you a large, powerful constituency that adds to your country's monitoring and evaluation function of those services. By so doing, empowering patients' rights to a whole new level. And the fifth item, the usual elephant in the room, who will foot the bill? We always ask that. Who will foot the bill? Show me the money, as somebody in Hollywood said. Show me the money. UHC is not a one-size-fits-all, but many countries will tell you that significant money came from simply reducing existing inefficiencies. Some from an increase in actual investment as a percentage of GDP. And of course, some from co-contributions from the public. Others utilize innovative financing, including earmarking what I call the good taxes, to finance some of the services, such as taxes on tobacco, alcohol, sugar, and salt, as the drivers of many NCDs. These provide triple wins. One reduces, one, it reduces the avalanche of new cancer patients, saves few future treatment costs, and at the same time provides new revenues for the budget for health and well-being. It's amazing. Three triple wins. We should think about that. Starting with fighting tobacco, that alone can reduce a third of all cancers and other NCDs. Other powerful examples include vacc vaccinating girls and boys with the cervical vaccine, the hepatitis vaccine, and others. UHC is not just about investing more, but investing better, investing smarter. 
And what have we as UICC contributed towards the success of UHC? First of all, the success of UIC, UICC is directly linked to the achievements of all its 1,170 members that make up this union from 177 countries and territories, spanning all income levels and health systems. The success of UICC is because of you all here in this room, members and partners. In its quest to continue to reduce the global cancer burden and to promote greater equity, UICC has joined new partnerships and established new initiatives to support this goal. After all, as a member organization, partnership is in our DNA. We don't like to waste resources, working in silos and duplicating efforts. And that's what I love about UICC. One example, UICC and 15 other organizations. One example, UICC and 15 organizations working on cancer control founded the International Cancer Control Partnership, the ICCP, in 2012. Now the ICCP consists of a group of 20 plus key organizations that have joined together to coordinate their efforts to support countries in national cancer control planning, development and implementation. And UICC hosts and manages this ICCP portal. Imagine, all these organizations were doing these efforts by themselves, each one alone. Now we have joined together. UICC is also a partner of the Global Initiative for Cancer Registry Development, GICR. GICR is a multi-partner response to the disparity in robust cancer statistics across the globe, led by IARC, the International Agency for Cancer Research. Without local, reliable, and high-quality data through a population-based registry approach, countries cannot know nor prioritize the exact burden of their disease. Acknowledging that UHC is not a one-size-fits-all, UICC then went regional, launching four regional leadership programs last year with 165 CEOs in Singapore, Muscat, Qatar, Dakar, and Mexico to share and learn from each other on different aspects of UHC. Then, UICC went national in cities. In that regard, UICC established, incubated, and launched a new standalone sister organization, City Cancer Challenge Foundation, CCAN, to support cities all over the world. What I love about the CCAN model is that it is a real life, logical business model that offers a new paradigm shift on how we can support cities in implementing cancer control. It is truly a powerful engine that supports a global community of cities and partners to work together to design, plan, and implement cancer solutions to save lives. While cities take the lead, they work closely with CCAN's multi-sector community of global and local partners who provide technical assistance through each phase of the initiative. What is crucial is that the city executive team includes all influencers and stakeholders of that city, government, public, civil society, the private sector. This forms a sustainable managerial infrastructure on the ground that can continue to push forward the, implement the implementation of the long-term action plans long after the CCAN team leaves, and this is what's important, in order to continue to transform cancer care in their city. Professor Sanchi Aranda, our wonderful UICC past president, is the new chairperson of this CCAN board. Furthermore, recognizing the power of civil societies to mobilize and move cancer agenda forward, UICC created an important advocacy initiative that essentially supports local civil society members with the, with the capacity building and training tools to better advocate on behalf of patients so that they are more successful on calling their governments to account with regards to closing the equity gap in access to cancer care and services in their own countries. So UICC is continuing to deliver on its mission and will continue to push on WHO's call for UHC. 
His call also for the elimination of cervical cancer, the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, all to address the unacceptable disparity in treatment and survival. Today, you will hear from countries who have achieved UHC or about to embark on it. I so look forward to the discussions. But be mindful of Dr. Tedros' saying, universal health coverage is the journey and impact is its destination. Thank you very much.